It's about that time. So, um, here's the thing. I wish we could turn back time to the good old days when a mama sang the bro fist. At face value, the interest people had in Quentin reviews perplexed me. A lot of YouTubers have the habit of spilling the odd take on Twitter, or saying things that alienate some of their audience from time to time. My tweets would probably fall into that, that category. Yeah. But since his initial departure from the community back in 2018 and subsequent meltdown, I figured that was all there was left to rag on him for. From time to time, I would see people dunking on him on Twitter. And even still, I didn't think much of it. But as it turns out, what I'd ignored is that things go much deeper than that initial controversy. If you really start to dig into his lore, if you were to walk up to Quentin and ask him why his old friends don't like him, or why his fans turned, he'll tell you that it's because he stopped taking the red pill. He became a progressive, a leftist, and as a result, his former skeptic friends decided to turn their backs on him. But this lie, of which he tells both to his audience and himself, couldn't be further from the truth. Quentin is a man consumed with self-pity, desperate for a sense of belonging to any specific group. What he seems to fail to realize is that the only reason he is in such a strange position right now is because of decisions that he's made. It's time to peer inside the brain of someone who is truly a fallen titan. Here's the thing. I fucking hate Trump. Watching Viacom go buy candy bars Sits a man with the neck for McDonald's Garfield powered mine A sex doll bought online Rescues the day from Trump and John Tron This is the theme song Few people today recognize just how influential early commentary content was on YouTube. Even people on the smaller end of the scale in sheer audience managed to have a profound effect in the following years of YouTube-related events. Quentin's channel wasn't the largest at the time, and he certainly didn't have the best videos, but he did command a certain air of respect due to his clear-cut argumentation and succinct writing. He was far from a throwaway, in fact, he was a staple. During this time, although Quentin was an up and coming channel, he quickly developed connections in the community and grew a pretty loyal audience. If you want to go purely by analytics, his most popular videos were all about YouTube drama. Subjects like Content Cop and Grade A Under A were the undisputed breadwinners on his channel. Just by the fact that this is how we've always known him, it's near impossible to think that this guy would exist in the real world. Accompanied by effective editing and writing, made his uploads stand out in a sea of, uh... Fucking hell, matey, what have you done this time? Bro, you have literally done a terrible thing today, and I must call you out on this behavior. What if I just call him the N-word? I'm not even old enough to have an AdSense account. Why am I here? I make good videos. Now I'm fucking mad! Quentin was very level-headed and reasonable. He didn't scream or get angry, and unlike other channels, who were hungry to devour their targets, he also seemed to express some sympathy for those who he criticized. And while his most popular videos for years were about subjects like Great A Under A and iDubs, discussing the circumstances around these creators and how he felt, that definitely wasn't his primary content. The majority of his videos from this time were actually movie reviews. Being inspired by media critique titans of old like Nostalgia Critic and ABGN, he would talk about films that interested him and give his take, being one of the most popular at the time doing this on the site. There was a certain charm to his videos that made them unique further by the channel in joke that he was just a neckbeard living in his parents' basement. People respected Quentin's perspective to the point that they'd pay hundreds of dollars just to hear him review a subject of their choosing. It was at this point that I was a fan of Quentin. As you can imagine, it was very flattering when I later got the opportunity to be his friend. He even gave me a shout out in a video. But all of this would not last. Curiously enough, seemingly out of the blue, Quentin began cutting off connections with much of the YouTube community. And it's not like they were all controversial figures. Most of these were universally beloved people, like Internet Historian, Nerd City, and The Right Opinion, who were just a few of the many he decided to part ways with during this time. These weren't just associates either, they were people he had publicly collaborated with, and even attended events with in the past. For some reason, Quentin just wasn't down with these guys anymore. So, why? 
What we didn't know at the time was that behind the scenes, Quentin had decided to get political. Whereas his videos before were mostly apolitical, they now had explicit statements of condemnation or endorsement. And even beyond that, the way that he delivered these opinions felt very ham-fisted and unnecessary. Most notably, his minute-long breakaway during a Logan Paul movie review to inform his audience that he didn't like Donald Trump. So, um, here's the thing. I fucking hate Trump. He embarrasses me every day. He makes us all look like backwards idiots, and frankly, the fact that he got elected means that we probably are all backwards idiots. Quinn was in the middle of some kind of political reawakening. He had found himself in an interesting place. He was becoming increasingly progressive as time went on, wanting to advocate for his thoughts on his channel. Meanwhile, his audience was sort of confused as to why he felt the need to do this all of a sudden, as a guy who talked about the Paul brothers for a living. Simultaneously, almost none of the people around him were explicitly political, opting to stay out of the subject altogether. At this time, he also began making statements frequently about how he used to be red-pilled, but was different now. He went out of his way to frequently state on record that he didn't like Nazis and grandstand about how he was cool because racists loved to hate him. Across community subreddits, people were left scratching their heads at this behavior. At this time, some of his animosity towards some of the YouTube community began to shine through in his videos as well, and the perfect storm of events tied to what he did only made this worse. Quentin's video about T-Series and PewDiePie was heavily criticized for a few arrogant statements he made, but was quickly deleted after he realized that it would be an extremely popular upload for him, seemingly recognizing at least some of his mistakes. This was only furthered by a joke from Quentin in a video, in which he called JonTron a racist, likely as a result of his debate with Destiny, where he advocated for the far right's popular Great Replacement Theory. Saying that every angry gamer is trying to be James Rolfe is like saying that every racist gamer is trying to be JonTron. Regardless of your opinion on JonTron and what he said in that debate, Quentin's joke here is important in context, because for anyone who still likes John at this time, this was bound to cause a rift between them and Quentin. The same thing occurred with PewDiePie, when Quentin criticized him openly for having Ben Shapiro in a video of his, saying he didn't want Ben, who he sees as a bigot, to be humanized on a large platform. All of these accumulated to mostly smaller channels and the local community latching onto his ethos. A guy who was previously in the commentary and anti-SJW community, who was now advocating for left-wing politics on a regular basis. But this wasn't the point of no return. Not yet. Any semblance of a connection to his former friends would be officially severed around the time that Monkey Jones had his original YouTube channel deleted, and Quentin, likely as retribution for a previous conflict, celebrated it on his Twitter. While the reaction to what is a clear joke was extreme, with the sensitivity of the issue at hand, people were naturally upset. For many, this was the nail in the coffin for his reputation amongst former peers, someone who was not just a former ally, but an active enemy. This was made worse by Quentin's responses to his critics. On December 5th of 2018, Quentin tweeted the following. So, there's this small group of commentary bros who are all friends and decided to all make videos on me around the same time. And they keep commenting, lol, I also made a Quentin video on each other's stuff, clearly to get views on all the vids. Like, who are they fooling? Haha, <laughs> I was warned by a friend that these guys were going to try to find dirt on me and that they smell blood in the water, so I expect to see some sharks coming after me. Instead, guppies. Little peeved guppies. Adorable. Manga Common, someone who had been critical of Quentin, and for full disclosure, myself, decided to make a tweet saying that Quentin was straw manning and couldn't take criticism. But even past any of that, there seems to be an inherent distaste for commentary channels. Like people who criticize other YouTubers are inherently lesser than him, despite the fact that the reason he ever became relevant in the first place was by making videos about YouTube drama. Once he began filing takedowns on archives of his videos, which is considered a cardinal sin to many, it was off to the races. I posted a video talking about Quentin, as did people like LS Mark and Daft Pina. The commentary community was up in arms about the way he had acted, with him being criticized for betraying many of his former friends. He left them behind. Not only that, but he had laughed at the misery of someone who, at the time, still had the goodwill of the community. In terms of sheer metrics, he didn't lose very much. His social blade barely went red for about a week before returning mostly back to normal. But in terms of respect from his peers, he had lost it all. That was okay though, right? They weren't as left-wing as he'd wanted them to be anyway, and they wouldn't stand up for what he thought was correct. Meanwhile, there was a whole new community of creators he was watching at the time who was explicitly political. And look, they talked about movies and internet culture too. They were just like him. He had the opportunity to make a new group of friends and hang out with a bunch of new cool kids. He could make new content to fit that community and get his way in there. He could have a new sense of friendship and camaraderie. And as we all know, if there's one great way to be friends with a YouTuber, it's to suck their fucking dick, or whatever else they may have.
watching porn by yourself. As far as I'm concerned, she is the most subscribed to personality literally everywhere because no, no one, one else, else on, on the, the internet, internet, internet exists. exists. Are traps gay? She is our dark queen, our glorious mother and comrade. And I think no other person has more influenced not only the sort of content I want to make, but also the person I want to strive to be. I'm gonna come. When I found her videos, I developed what I guess you'd call a crush. But it was more of like a knowledge crush. I wanted to have and absorb the knowledge and understanding the topics. Okay, let's set the record straight. Orbiting is defined by UrbanDictionary.com as when someone focuses all their attention on a specific person when they're around. This can include shifting their personal beliefs and opinions to match the person that's being orbited. There's no video more important to analyzing Quentin's political reawakening than his ContraPoints upload. It simultaneously serves as a perfect time capsule for his mentality and an extremely important stepping stone in understanding why his videos today are so unbearable. And it was because of VidCon last year that I met Natalie Wynn at the Cheesecake Factory. And having absolutely no idea who she was, I decided to go home and binge a bunch of her channel. And I think no other person has more influenced not only the sort of content I want to make, but also the person I want to strive to be. This video, which is now deleted, is 17 minutes of sucking on the toes of YouTube's most influential leftist, ContraPoints. Natalie Wynn, or Contra, is someone who has become widely popular in the last few years for her long video essays about philosophy, politics, the online world, and more broadly, culture at large. In his video, Quentin states that after meeting Natalie, he became so enamored with her that he decided to binge all of her channel, quickly growing to idolize her as a content creator. While Quentin tries to play off his constant admiration for Contra, and make it seem like it's not that serious, this entire video is a joke, and it's almost creepy. And for us to have any chance of fixing this, to have any possibility of making the internet anything more than a burning dumpster fire, there's something you have to do. You have to subscribe to ContraPoints. The idea that a YouTube channel is going to save the internet and the world at large is something that I think even she would laugh at. And as a result, the reception to this video was sort of mixed, even among leftists. Honey, it's 2019. Get a new boogeyman. His habit of complimenting a creator incessantly as a means of trying to make a connection is something that is common for Quentin. And while we have no evidence that it worked with Contra, we do know someone who it did work with. ContraPoints is the only YouTuber. I'm just realizing as I film this that this video is probably going to be my most intellectually upfront and honest video I've done in a while. My Wikitubia page implies in the controversies section that I became a leftist because of my friendship with at Mary Sue Writer, which is not true, but it is really fascinating. Mary Sue Ryder is the Twitter handle of Sarah Z, a YouTuber who makes video essays about the internet and pop culture. The fact that she's a leftist was, I imagine, a bonus to Quentin. A girl who makes videos, and she's quirky and knows internet stuff. Awesome. Through complimenting her, both in videos and on Twitter, Quentin became acquainted with Sarah, and the two began a public friendship where they would reply to each other's tweets. They even met in person. But sometime in 2020, this friendship seemingly ended. The two unfollowed each other on Twitter, and they stopped talking altogether. But apart from the loss of a mutual Twitter follow, there would not be any public confirmation of this until the first few weeks of 2021. On January 13th, Sarah Z tweeted out, This is weird. Please don't do this. Hey, I figure we don't like each other for some reason, so I'm just gonna unfollow. Sarah followed up by saying, For context, this is from another creator who has done things like publicly mention in their videos when I haven't responded to their messages. It's weird and uncomfortable, and it puts people in an awkward position. But Sarah wasn't alone. Fellow video essayist Lindsay Ellis left a reply as well. I think we may both be on the receiving end of inappropriate messages from the same person. Please, don't do this. Attached were other messages as well, of some anonymous individual trying to strike up some sort of friendship repeatedly before apologizing for ever sending the messages in the first place. Sarah elaborated, saying, There's just this brand of self-pitying pushiness that really irks me. When someone behaves inappropriately, gets told they're behaving inappropriately, and then deliberately solicits pity and validation from people who don't have context. It's a bit frustrating. 
I couldn't get in contact with Sarah Z, so I'll have to do the voice of Irma this time. These messages are all extremely cringy, but beyond that, if this was just an anonymous individual, then ultimately it wouldn't matter, right? People in the replies and quote tweets began to speculate that this was Quentin, and if we take a look at the profile pictures, the colors certainly seem to line up. Not to mention that a cursory check of mutuals reveals that he and Lindsay also didn't follow each other. While publicly, Quentin ignored the controversy, he did make a few sad boy posts around the time. The ultimate confirmation, however, that this was actually Quentin would come in the form of leaked logs from his Patreon Discord, which were then uploaded to a gossip forum that I probably mention way too much in my videos. Here, from a few messages, it was made apparent that Quentin knew of what Sarah and Lindsay had tweeted, and he confirmed that he was the one being referenced. Okay, I've moved on to anger. I'm really angry now. This is a new set of emotions, lol. I'm really sweaty because I'm feeling like anger for the first time in days. I still won't comment on it publicly, but this is some bullshit, you know? You know what's funny? Money. Throughout all of this bullshit, I have never once leaked private information about her. I know private information about her, which proves she's a hypocrite, but I don't fucking leak that shit. You know why? Because those were private moments we had, and it's a basic presumption of human goodness to not air that shit years later, exclusively for the purpose of causing embarrassment. Given that the two met up in person, and the fact that Quentin references some private moments that he won't out because they were moments that they shared together, I would say that he cherishes friendship with her a lot. It's possible that this went even farther than a friendship as well. Unfortunately, for those looking to get to the bottom of this, Quentin kept it noticeably vague, and really just used this as an opportunity to vent to some of his fans. But this isn't the end of what we can gather here. Let's revisit Quentin's messages to Lindsay Ellis, someone who he looks up to a lot and has been watching ever since her days on Channel Awesome. I'm in town if you're ever free. If not, I totally understand. This message was sent on July 11th at night. The next morning, he followed up by saying, hey, sorry, never mind. Lindsay lives in Long Beach, California, which is less than a half hour drive away from Anaheim, where VidCon is held every year. That year, on the same day, Quentin was at VidCon attending panels and meeting up with friends. One of these panels, in specific, was hosted by none other than Lindsay Ellis and ContraPoints. But from the messages, we can assume that they never met up for dinner. After all, if they did, he probably would have made a tweet about it. Fast forward six months to January of 2020, and Quentin was back in California, visiting his favorite place, Disneyland. Here, he messaged Lindsay again, asking to hang out saying, anyway, yeah, if you want to get dinner or something, I, I don't really care either way. As I read this back, I realize how bitchy this message sounds. Sorry, I've just had a really bad trip. Like all my trips, really. I won't bother you anymore after this. Have a good year. If we cross-reference this with Quentin's Twitter again, we can see him tweeting sadly about being alone at Disneyland. Disney can be really sad when you're alone too long inside it. People always ask me if I'm done with Disney World, but I don't have any friends who are into theme parks, and I think if I did it alone, I'd be very sad the whole time. I think I might just be done doing theme parks, to be honest. He tries to hang out with her at VidCon. She doesn't respond. He flies out again half a year later to go to Disney alone, and also in the hopes that he can finally meet up with her. But Lindsay ignores him again. This experience experience is then so bad that he claims to be done with theme parks entirely. Do you see how fucking sad this is? I would actually be amazed to see what his messages with Contra are like, if he has any. If you haven't picked up on it by now, Quentin really wanted to be in the friend group that most would deem bred to, in spite of the fact that they themselves have publicly stated they're not all as close as they seem. And for a while, he may have convinced himself that it could work. But in reality, it seems he's closer to someone else orbiting the community. Go give it to you. Just months prior to Sarah Z's tweet chastising Quentin, the similarly sized movie Bob was ridiculed for having an incident also involving Lindsay Ellis. In his case, he was obsessively refollowing Lindsay after being softlocked, and then publicly acting like they were close associates based off of a handful of photographs taken at conventions. It's also worth noting that all of this was spilled and elaborated on in Quentin's Patreon server, people who he emotionally confides in when he has hardships. Probably not the best idea to put your emotional vulnerability in the hands of a bunch of people who already look up to you and pay to be around you. But that's not all. Let's tie this all together. In 2019, Quentin makes a trip out to California to attend VidCon, with a glimmer in his eye as he can finally meet all of his favorite bread tubers. Though he does meet a few, including Sarah Z and H Bomber Guy, he unsuccessfully manages to get into contact with Lindsay. Instead, he settles for attending a panel she did with ContraPoints, the latter of whom he meets afterwards and has his supposed awakening moment. Bear in mind, this is all while commentary YouTubers from the event recall trying to message Quentin to meet up to no success, including Daft Pina. Quentin had high hopes for VidCon most of which were dashed upon attending. 
And while this may seem odd, it may make more sense when you realize he's made multiple videos in the past trying to find meaning from the event. This included three uploads specifically regarding VidCon 2017, which, as it turns out, is important, as it's where Quentin first began truly elaborating on his reasons for distancing himself from the commentary community. Looking at his channel today, we can only find two videos discussing his trip to the event that year. That's because his third installment is one of the aforementioned videos that he's repeatedly copyright striked off the platform. The video is titled, I Hated the politics of VidCon, and upon watching it all of these years later, it's clear that this was the start of his turn against the commentary community. At the time, commentators were very friendly with the still popular skeptic community, and it wasn't even out of the ordinary to see people like Bunty King defend those contemplating the JQ. This video centers around an incident in which the skeptics, led by Sargon of Akkad, sat in at a women online panel, headlined by Anita Sarkeesian. The video takes a surprisingly middle-of-the-road approach, as Quentin attempts to examine the rights and wrongs of each side even-handedly. This included criticism VidCon itself for not inviting the equivalent conservative speakers. The problem with doing things like this is that once you choose one side of a narrative to push, you take part in trying to sell someone's ideology as reality. Simply by only inviting people who hate Trump and loved Obama, you are painting a misconstructed image of the world. And when you do that, people get upset. He then emphasizes just how conflicted he was producing it, noting that he'd written approximately six to seven drafts, of which progressively leaned more and more towards the side of the feminists. And this, strangely enough, is one of the few cases where it's not just the people running the show who I'm mad at. I've written around six or seven drafts all about the politics surrounding certain events at VidCon, and the first draft was very anti anita Sarkeesian, anti-Francesca Ramsey, pro-Sargon, pro-sitting protests, and each time I rewrote the script, things started to melt a little bit more, and by the end of the version that's about to be uploaded, I'm basically going to be pinned as a social justice warrior by a lot of the people who would otherwise like me. Sorry? The video concludes with Quentin sympathizing heavily with one speaker from the panel, Francesca Ramsey, of which he notes he found himself often agreeing with, even though she was supposedly deemed as one of the unapproachables by his peers. He even attacked Baring for a perceived dismissal and attempted deplatforming of them, though this point is rather weak. You see, this is an important distinction. You didn't make this video because you had a political point to make. You made it because you dislike a woman online and you wanted to remove their ability to have a voice. It's with that that we can begin to gain more insight into his position at the time. Namely, that he felt like he hadn't truly considered the other aisle of the political spectrum. And if it were left at just that, I probably would not be talking about him today. But Quentin's perspective continued to shift dramatically after this video. He ends it by lamenting just how much he hated the politics of YouTube and just how fake it was. I can't stand the politics of YouTube. It's so fake and annoying on both sides of the political map. It's filled with people pretending that they're upset about something to make a point and doing things that they said not to do to show that it's a thing not to do. It's like an episode of It's Always Sunny, but online and not entertaining. But most importantly, it's a cycle of individuals who come to find themselves more enamored with clicks rather than discussions. But something clearly changed here, and where once Quentin hated the politics of YouTube for how performative it came across, he began indulging in it himself. More and more often in his videos, he began implementing tangents with the explicit purpose of virtue signaling, and it's only gotten worse with time, bringing us full circle to the events of 2018. But believe it or not, this gallery of cringe doesn't end at odd behavior in orbiting. You are alone. All alone. You feel disconnected. You feel like you don't belong. You feel like you don't have a lot of friends in your space. And worst of all, it's not your fault. It's all out of your control. The damn shame about YouTube is most of the creators I look up to already know who I am and think poorly of me. Met a creator at VidCon in 2019, shook his hand, said I was a fan. He made a face like he had just chugged rotten milk. Like, edgy creators dislike me because I betrayed the YouTube community, and lefty cliques dislike me because they have deemed me one of the bad ones in the dirtbag left, so they tend to run out of the room to avoid talking to me. When someone likes you, they give you a nice thought every once in a while. When someone hates you, they make it their life to hate you. 
Their hatred isn't complete until you've lost all sense of worth. Do you know what shocks me about this thing where everyone wants to expose me? No one has ever reached out to me in private. Not once. Never. Instead, it instantly became, let's stop talking about him like he's a real person. Like, this is supposed to not push me away? Do you know how stressful it is to think that these dudes have literally been gaslighting your friends into a narrative they've invented about you? Suddenly, when you message a YouTube friend and they don't respond, you think, oh, they must hate me now. It is not fun. Analyzing these tweets gives us a good view into Quentin's brain and how he feels about YouTube in general. If you read anything from his Twitter account, you would be led to believe that his departure for much of the YouTube community is something that is not his fault. He would have you believe that he was unjustly cancelled, and that everyone turned their backs on him in his time of need. A lot of people figured out that I used to be a certain way on YouTube, and now I've sort of evolved to a different person with different perspectives. And I guess I've really been pushed away from everyone the last month and a half because... I haven't had anyone really try and reach out to me. Like, people who have the ability to reach out to me. I haven't had that. I've had people who agree with me reach out to me, and I've had people who disagree with me uh, shit talk me. <laughs> this is categorically untrue. In fact, his interpretation isn't just flimsy. It's a lie. While it's true that some people in Quentin's audience probably left his channel, purely based on the fact that he became an open leftist, this was a relatively small minority of those who left during 2018. Rather, what truly drove people away was his treatment of other people who he knew. Even past the point where he was making Trump bad statements in his videos and grandstanding on Twitter about PewDiePie and Ben Shapiro, he still had the support of the YouTube community. What truly ruined it all was his own actions. It's really weird seeing some YouTube comedians make all these positive political posts knowing how those same guys turned their backs on me in 2018 because I said transphobia was bad, haha. <laughs> Statements like this are commonplace, and they're not just reductive, it's bullshit. Quinnstorians will often reference VidCon 2018 as a turning point for him, and this is indeed the case. After that VidCon, things just were not the same. He began unfollowing or outright blocking people he had been cool with for months. In some cases, these were people he knew and collaborated with for two years. He stopped associating with people like The Right Opinion and Jay Aubrey, two people who were, to my knowledge, leftists who advocate for many of the same positions that Quentin does. He stopped talking to Nerd City. He unfollowed almost all of the old community that he was a part of. He left behind friends who had helped him on projects and done collaborations with him. And you know what? Maybe he would have been able to get away with that. Sometimes people just need a fresh start, right? I can respect that. But it wasn't a peaceful departure. After he had unlisted some of his worst received videos, people began uploading them to YouTube for archival purposes. This is one of the most important functions of the internet, being able to preserve digital media in an age when there was a whole community built around finding things that are lost. Quentin wasn't pleased with this, deciding to take down reuploads via the DMCA system. And while he may have been legally within his right, people took issue with the fact that it felt like he was trying to hide those videos, something he would later admit to on an episode of the State of the YouTube podcast. I didn't really realize it was that controversial that I took down a re-upload of my own video. Uh, and I guess, I guess, I've thought about um, maybe at a time where I'm not getting a lot of heat of releasing some of those claims uh, because it was just two of them. Uh, but I, I feel like I don't want to do it in a point where like everyone's actively going after me because I don't want that to be the reason why I'm doing it. This podcast tone in particular is important to note. Throughout the entire thing, Quentin sounds extremely nervous and like he's under a lot of stress. It's kind of hard to listen to, actually. But this response doesn't make sense given his headstrong attitude in videos and on Twitter, which led to this podcast even existing. Throughout this video, you will see Quentin pulling something really stupid. Once consequences happen for his actions, he will timidly attempt to outline why he has been wronged, and he's actually the victim. In 2019, Quentin Reviews got himself into some drama regarding the, at the time, newest installment in the Star Wars franchise. This gets a little convoluted, so let's try to unweave this strange web. I Hate Everything made a video in defense of The Last Jedi. Another YouTuber by the name of Rags then made a video where he criticized his defense of The Last Jedi. Following this, The Right Opinion made a response to Rags' response to I Hate Everything, wherein Quentin guest starred and criticized Rags at length. 
If all of this sounds really dumb, that's because it is. But what it adds up to in the end is Quentin criticizing a YouTuber who he didn't like through someone else's video. When Rags and Mahler criticized the Right Opinions video, especially the parts with Quentin, Tro ended up having to go on their podcast to hopefully defend and explain the video. This did not go super well. The video was now unlisted due to this. But that wasn't exactly an isolated event. Quentin, pretty much every time Quentin's face popped up in that video, it was a straw man. It was a well, non sequitur. Sure. It was something completely irrelevant to what we were discussing. Despite Quentin having the most biting criticisms of these people, when push came to shove, well, he got shoved. He didn't even try to argue. Furthermore, if you even try to watch Quentin's portions, almost everything he said was misrepresentations of the points he was trying to critique. And his unwillingness to even talk to someone he started shit with is kind of telling. The only official response that they even got from him was a simple Twitter block. Relationship ended with the commentary community. Now bread YouTube is my best friend. Let's return to Tro and Jay Aubrey, two commentary creators who, as I mentioned before, are leftists. But their audiences haven't left them. In fact, they've grown into very large channels in the last two years. So why is it that Quentin fucked it all up during his own political transition? The answer to that question comes in the form of one word, alienation. Quentin did not have a peaceful or smooth transition into being an open leftist. Instead, he decided to do things the hard way. Just because you decided to try and attract a left-wing audience and make definitive statements about politics doesn't mean that every Everyone else has to. For people who talk about internet history or YouTube drama, in many cases, a two-party us versus them political discussion is just not a part of it. The community did not leave Quentin. Quentin left the community, lit a fire, and then tripped over himself 20 times while pouring lighter fluid on it. Now he's crying over his burns and blaming everyone else. You know, it's been a while since I've really torn into someone, and going into this video, I didn't think that that would be the tone I would go for. I expected it to be more akin to documenting someone who did something very stupid, but you know, they could probably come back from it given time. There's there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So this is the point of the video where I say that I actually kind of feel bad for the guy I'm talking about, and despite what they did, I understand some of their struggle, and you know, I can sympathize with them, but I don't have to do that, and I, I don't want to. Quentin is a pitiful guy but he's also an ungrateful, selfish asshole. He acted like a dick to all of his friends, at once. People he had collaborated with, people who in the past had praised his work. This was because of a seemingly well-meaning political transition to a more progressive ideology. But the way he went about this was so counterproductive to friendship that he ended up pushing away further connections. He often cries about the fact that people don't want to be his pal, but the truth is that he doesn't have friends because he's a shitty friend. He expects respect when he has a habit of not giving it. I think he's an unlikable asshole who will never accept personal responsibility for his own actions. Instead, he will simply run back to his Patreon Discord to cry about circumstances that he created, and probably shoot himself in the foot a few more times along the way. I've been Turkey Tom, thanks for watching, and until next time, maybe you just need to hit that chug jug, bro. Before I go, this video is sponsored by the Half-Baked Podcast. It's a drama and commentary show. We have really cool art for it. The episodes are really great. We have some awesome chemistry and banter. We actually just had Keemstar on the latest episode. It's linked below. Watch it now. I've been Turkey Tom, and until next time, leave me alone.